My name is Franklin, and I'm an atheist. How would you know at all if you're being accurate? I've read a lot about religion. What exactly does through Jesus Christ mean? What is it about their religion that resonates with who they are? If not an anthropomorphic being, is there an enemy? How does their religion make them a better person? Can you explain uh, to me and anybody who doesn't know what a mitzvah is? What do they think is missing about how we understand the world? What would be the difference between praying on a subject and just thinking on a subject? Why don't people have superpowers anymore? I think it's important to talk to them and find out what they believe. Hello everyone. Thanks again to everyone who's helping out on Patreon. The links are here and down below in the thingy. One of the difficulties in creating this series is humor. Finding the line between amusing and offensive is troublesome when talking about people's faith. This episode is about Norse gods, so I probably shouldn't do a bit with lightning hammers. That said, whenever Mr. Fiala Copy mentions Odin, I picture Anthony Hopkins in my head. I hope you enjoy the interview and stick around for the end where I talk about two things. Hello and welcome to the What They Believe series. In the entertainment business, there's a legend that the television show Saturday Night Live will have once a year a disaster show where everything just seems to go wrong. The audience at home normally doesn't notice and it is a live show so you can expect these sort of things. This was my disaster show. Due to a hardware issue, we completely lost the last episode and this one we had about 20 minutes where Zoom just wouldn't cooperate. But here we are and my guest was nice enough to come back. Oh yeah, my guest. My guest today is Otar Fialakapi of Asatru. Thank you for joining us, Otar. Thank you, Franklin. It's nice to be here. Have you always been also true, or did you convert? Um, I'm a convert. Uh, I was raised Roman Catholic. And long about 2007, I had uh, had my fill of various methods of divination that were common among people in my practice, the Yijing, uh, tarot, and geomancy. Um, so I decided to explore other avenues of symbolic communication and came upon the runes, um, which had a big impact on me and um, kind of impelled me to look deeper into the culture and tradition uh, behind the runes. And so the uh, short version is through that I found Asatru and really found uh, a spirituality um, that was very um familiar almost instantly, um, something that felt very comfortable and, and really felt like a kind of homecoming. So what are some of the basic principles or tenets? How does someone become a Nasatru? And something that is actually very much under discussion um, on an almost continuous basis, particularly on social media, is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? Uh, the word Asatru was formulated by a man called Magnus Magnuson, who was um, not only a prolific writer and translator of um, Old Norse uh, legends and sagas and folklore, um, but was also the, the host of a, a popular uh, quiz show in the United Kingdom. So the word itself, uh, Asa true, it's two parts, um, literally means true to, to the as, um, to the gods. And so obviously the first step, you know, when one begins a journey uh, toward Asa true is, um, you know, after a period of learning and contemplation and so on, uh, if the system of belief touches someone or resonates with them, then they align themselves um, to its belief system. Although we would maintain that there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong way. Uh, we kind of joke for if there were 10 Ossetruers in the room, probably one would find 11 ways of being an Ossetruer. Um, and so obviously belief in the gods um, is, is a central tenant, modeling our lives and, and behavior on the examples that are set in the Eddas and Sagas to a certain extent, and practicing the religion, making offerings um, to the gods, to land spirits, and to ancestors. Ancestor veneration is a, a very big part of Asatru and, and something that we think is important. So um, doing those things to, to varying degrees, uh, whatever resonates is true um, for the person within the belief system. Um, is what would really constitute becoming an Asatruer. Unlike other systems of religion, like for example, in Christianity, there are rites of initiation, um, baptism and uh, confirmation. We don't necessarily practice those kinds of things. Um, we will name newborn children in a ceremonial setting, 
uh, if if that's something that the parents want, but there isn't necessarily a, a threshold ceremony through which one would pass to become an Aussie trooper. In researching various faiths, I've been fascinated by the stories of creation, how the earth and humans came, came to be. Can you explain the Asatru creation story? So in, uh, the Voluspa is one of the, the books in, um, in the Eddas, uh, which is a word that means great grandmother. It's kind of the recollection of um, the legends that uh, preceded Christianization. Uh, in Scandinavia, and so it, it's held that, that prior to the beginning, there was a, a, a kind of void um, that's been described as a magically charged void called Ganungagap, and is not necessarily a void in the sense of, of simply being an empty space, but a, a kind of um, a, a space filled with potential um, for manifestation. The lore tells us that to the north, of Genunga Gap, there was a world called Niflheimer, and then to the south, a world called Muspelheimer. So the, the fire and ice, basically uh, a sort of yin and yang of, of, uh, of our native spirituality. And so gradually sparks and fire from Muspelheimer and ice and mist and frost from Niflheimer started to encroach into Genunga Gap. And when they connected, um, obviously, fire meeting ice, the ice starts to melt and produces water. And so out of the water comes uh, the first proto-being called Umir, um, more commonly pronounced Emir. Uh, and he is a kind of hermaphroditic, he is not an accurate pronoun necessarily, but that being is a, is a, is a hermaphrodite and um, starts to reproduce um, asexually and his children, quote unquote, are the frost giants. Um, the first kind of primal race of beings. Um, as the water uh, continues, the ice and the fire continue to connect and the ice melts and more water is produced. The second being, um, a, a great cow called Aldumbla, um, which literally means a uh, hornless cow rich in milk, <laughs> um, is, uh, comes into being and she nourishes Emir. And she nourishes herself by licking the frost and the ice that, that is continuing to encroach into Ganungagap. And in so doing, she uncovers the first, what we would call proto-god, um, which is a, a, a male being um, referred to as Buri. Buri mates with an unknown frost giant and the two of them uh, produce uh, boar. So Buri is the father of boar and boar is the second kind of proto-god um, if you will, and Bor mates with a, a female frost giant called Bestla, and um, Bor and Bestla produce um, Odin, or as we would uh, pronounce in Olnars, Odin, and his brothers Vili and Ve. The three brothers uh, decide that they want to create the manifest universe, and the material out of which they do that is Ymir, and so they kill Ymir and make various features uh, of the manifest universe. For example, out of his skull, they made the sky, out of his teeth, they made the rocks, out of his blood, they made the oceans, et cetera. After the, the creation process was um, completed, uh, the brothers are walking along a beach uh, when they see two large pieces of driftwood, uh, Osk and Embla, and they make a male and female. And so they um, give them various gifts. Um, the gift of breath, the gift of color and complexion, the gift of intelligence, and the gift to appreciate the sacred, among other things. Once Osk and Embla are created, then uh, Odin and his brothers surround the Midgar, the, the, the material world, the earth, where we live with a great wall to protect um, humanity from the frost giants, because obviously <laughs> killing Ymir was not something that, that engendered a lot of goodwill um, for Odin and his brothers. And so that's sort of how it all uh, came into being. Of course, I, I don't know any Asatruer, and certainly myself included, who believe any of that literally. It's all symbolic. The idea of um, Niflheimer and Muspelheimer could be, you know, for example, likened to force and form or um, matter and energy combining and so on. I see that Asatru is polytheistic. I always wondered if you do pray to higher powers, to which one do you pray? That's a great question, uh, because again, the spiritual relationships that, that various Asatruer have can be widely varied. For example, some Asatruer will focus exclusively on their ancestors. 
um, which is not to suggest that they don't necessarily believe in the gods, but that's that's the spiritual way that works for them. Some also true are not many, but some are henotheistic. So they'll believe in all of the gods, but focus their spirituality exclusively on one god or goddess. Um, there is some tradition in our native spirituality called Odinism. And so folks that follow that tradition tend to focus more exclusively on Odin, um, whereas others will focus on all the gods and observe a round of seasonal rites um, in which various goddesses and gods are commemorated at different times of the year. Do you have a concept of a soul? How do you understand the soul? That's a good question. The word There is an Old Norse word for soul, which is sal, but that word didn't come into the vocabulary until after Christianization. Instead, we had a much more kind of complex view of, of what composes um, the human person spiritually and physically, our, our kind of spiritual anthropology, if you will. Uh, so we hold that um, human beings are, are made of several components. The most obvious is of which um, we call the leek, which is the actual physical body. And the leek is contained within a spiritual organism called the hammer. And it's kind of similar in many ways to um, uh, what theosophists would refer to as a, a kind of etheric envelope or astral um, body. Obviously, uh, mentation is a very important part um, uh, of, any, of the human person. And so, we maintain that um, we, we have the huger, um, which is the uh, mind thinking, the cognitive process, and mini, which is memory, which are held to be very important divine gifts. Um, there's in, in the Eddas, uh, it's written that, uh, that Odin says he has two ravens called Hugin and Munin, and that he says, Hugin and Munin fly each day over the spacious earth. I fear for Hugin that he come not back, yet more anxious am I for Munin. And so obviously memory is a really important thing. And it features as, um, as a very prominent concern in several places in the lore where um, the, the gods themselves, particularly Odin, will go back to beings that were in existence before they were the giants um, because they are, are gifted with this tremendous memory. And so they can remember everything back to the beginning. Um, the human person is animated by um, a, a force that we call Ond, um, which is very much like the uh, you know, various concepts, um, spiritus to the, to the Romans, pneuma to the Greeks, uh, ruach to Hebrews, chi and ki in the Orient and so on. And so we uh, are also imbued under certain circumstances with an additional force um, called odor, which is uh, poetic inspiration, kind of a divine frenzy of creativity um, that can be gifted by the gods under certain circumstances. Um, the human person also has a force um, within and about them that we call hemingya, um, which is probably most easily translated as luck, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, good fortune and the force that brings good fortune. And additionally, um, all people are, um, accompanied through life by a being that we call the Furgya, um, which would be somewhat similar to, oh, the, the Romans idea of the genius or Greeks, daemon, or um, uh, in the Greco-Egyptian magical tradition of the Mediterranean, the Augoades. Um, this is a being that kind of follows us and makes sure that we stay on the path of our, of our, our log, our fate, um, or our destiny and provides not only a protective function, but a tutelary function as well. One of the most intriguing things in discussing religion is the concept of an afterlife. In your tradition, is there a, an afterlife and are there good and bad versions? That, that's a great question. We definitely have a fairly well-developed uh, eschatology, but it's not something on which there's any kind of universal agreement, either among scholars. And the reason for that is, uh, you, there's a lot of information recorded in the Eddas and the sacred lore uh, about the afterlife, but, but there is um, some thought that it may have been augmented by uh, the folks that recorded the Eddas that wrote them down um, for the first time uh, based on their uh, Christian beliefs. Um, and, and that may or may not have actually taken place and we're, we're not really certain um, at this point, but 
Um, probably the most famous and recognizable um, destination in the afterlife, if you will, is Valhall or Valhalla, um, which is a place where fallen warriors go and they comprise the company that's called the Einherjar, um, warriors that are uh, preparing for an event called Ragnarok, which is the, the doom or the twilight of the gods, um, where the Einherjar will help Odin to fight um, various monsters and, and forces of chaos. Um, the other half, or the, and uh, so Odin receives half of the slain warriors on the battlefield. The other half go to the goddess Freya or Freya, um, to her hall, Sesramnir, where they celebrate a great big eternal banquet and party, um, so to speak. Um, and her hall is located in a place, Folkvangar, and so, or, or the people's field, or the, you know, so on. Um, the, the rest of us kind of schmoes who don't um, die heroically on the battlefield um, go to uh, the halls of hell. Um, and that's hell with just one L and it's not necessarily a place of punishment. Um, in fact, in, in some respects, it's a place of celebration and um, relaxation and a reunion um, with our ancestors. Um, so in, in our common parlance in everyday conversations, we talk about that as going, you know, if someone has passed away, we say that they've gone to the halls of their ancestors. Um, there is a, a provision for um, people uh, of particularly bad moral character um, and that the three most serious uh, sort of spiritual crimes, if you will, um, would include murder, marital infidelity and oath breaking. And so folks that, that have lived a life that have been lives that have been characterized by um, that kind of behavior will pass down um, into hell, um, but then they will cross over um, a river to a shore called Nastron, which basically means corpse shore, there to be chewed on for all time by um, the, the serpent uh, or dragon called Nidog. Belief evolved in Western Scandinavia um, sometime a little bit later um, of a place called uh, Helgarfjö, which is basically kind of like a sacred mountain. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have a specific geographic location on earth. Um, it, it could be whatever mountain was um, most prominent and close to a particular settlement. Um, and it was held to be so holy as a home of the ancestors um, that one had to wash one's face before one could even turn to look at it. Um, and so the, it's held that, that within these mountains, the ancestors um, feast and rejoice and, and celebrate banquets and parties and you know, so on and, and revel in the joy of the afterlife. Um, and so one of the things that we've learned from archeology span um, also, which is very prominent um, now is that, is that it's very clear given the grave goods that were often interred um, with people in burial mounds that, that the ancestors did believe that, that life went on in some fashion very similar to the way um, that it did on earth. So it's common to find people buried with um, weaponry and jewelry and um, tools for domestic chores and things of that nature, clothing and so on. Scientists say that 99% of all the species that have ever lived, lived are now extinct. Um, there has to be some extrapolation here, since the fossil record cannot possibly contain them all. The same can be said for forms of worship. My question is, if an ancient tradition is lost, how can it be restored with any hope of accuracy? And there are a couple of points that I'd like to make on that. So first, um, we do know from the historical record that when um, Osetry was the common cultural practice of Northern Germanic and Scandinavian peoples, um, that it evolved and changed, for example. So uh, prior to the Viking Age, um, which began at 793 uh, of the Common Era um, with the raid on the Church of St. Cuthbert on, um, and the monastic community at Lindisfarne, um, human sacrifice was fairly common. And that was typically um, enemies that were captured in battle, etc., cetera, were um, hanged uh, from trees and offered to Odin as a sacrifice. But by the time the Viking Age came around, that, that practice had stopped. Um, 
And so we ha we do have an, an historical record that shows that 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 the spirituality was evolving even even within um, the the culture uh, in, in which it was practiced. Um, we're not sure why um, that decision is made was made at the time. Um, but it, the other things that we have are um, historical records. Some um, from people that were very antithetical to um, to the belief system. It was. Uh, in later Saxon times, after uh, right of the period, kind of that liminal period between um, the pagan past and Christianization, um, one had to swear an oath forsaking Odin and Thor and the various gods in order to become baptized. Um, but we have a number of historical figures who have recorded things about the faith. Um, uh, Saxo Grammaticus, who was a, a monk in Denmark, wrote an extensive treatise on um, the myths and legends and customs and practices of the pagan past. Um, we have similar material from the Venerable Bede um, and from the Roman uh, writer and historian Tacitus. Um, we have an account uh, in his book called Germania, um, was exploring the North on behalf of the Roman army uh, to learn about the culture and belief system and so on. So um, while there may be some identifiable inaccuracies now, uh, in, in those writings. Nevertheless, they kind of provide a framework that's very helpful in sort of understanding um, the way that the faith was practiced in times. Um, church laws and prohibitions that came about after Christianization um, have also been very helpful too. Um, you know, for example, prohibitions against leaving offerings at sacred wells or um, making offerings or performing devotions at sacred trees. And so we've been able to kind of cobble together um, what it was that the ancestors were doing, but but very much um, in, in a spirit uh, of critical thinking, of of looking at um, what would have you know what obviously worked for them culturally, socially, and religiously um, back at that time, but bearing in mind also that uh, you know not only was the faith evolving then, it would have continued to evolve um, if it hadn't been interrupted by interrupted by Christianization. Um, so, for example, um, it's very uncommon for Asatrur these days to sacrifice animals um, to the gods. So the, um, the folks that I practice the faith with, that, that's not an activity that we do, even though there's an historical precedent for it. Um, additionally, as we've learned more about the world, obviously, we've had to um, kind of shift and evolve our beliefs. For example, um, our lore is centered around a, a, a geocentric idea uh, of the way that the universe is composed. Obviously, we know that's not the case. So, you know, while we have very interesting uh, legends of the, the solar goddess, Saul or Asuna, um, riding across the sky in her chariot pulled by her horses, Arvac, Arundal's V, we know obviously that the sun is not pulled across the sky in a giant chariot. So, um, so it will continue to evolve, but again, we have that, that kind of underpinning that structure or foundation based on a great deal of available information that's also been um, augmented and, and fleshed out, if you will, um, by a, a lot of developments in archaeology, anthropology, etc. What is one common ritual you do as a part of your affirmation of belief? The most common is a ritual we call blot, which um, it goes back to antiquity, although Again, we don't know precisely what what whether or not there was an exact rubric attached to um, its execution. It could have been something very simple, very complex. But we've more or less, at, at least again with the, the folks I practice the faith with, um, come up with a kind of standard format. And essentially, it's an offering in which devotion is expressed, um, uh, gratitude is is given to the gods for blessings received, etc. Uh, and it, typically, it, it involves an offering of mead or ale or um, some other kind of alcoholic beverage um, with prayers and invocations um, and so on, expressions of devotion. Christianity has been the single biggest influence on religious life in the United States, even for people who are not Christian. As I've read, the resurgence of Asatru has been a response to the Christianization of Iceland. Can you explain more on this? I, I wouldn't necessarily character, characterize it as a response. Um, it, it's maintained by many people with um, evidence that isn't necessarily definitive, I'll put it that way, that, that the ancient folkways survived in secret. Um, 
Iceland was not converted by force um, like many other uh, places in Europe. Um, it was more, I mean, it's a, it's a complex issue, but essentially it, it boils down to a few things, one of which being economic pressure um, that the Icelanders were threatened with being cut off um, from regular trade relations um, unless conversion took place. So in the year 1000, the, the uh, assembly or kind of Congress, if you will, um, of Iceland, literally called the thing, um, voted uh, in favor of Christianization. And so the, the, it remained nominally, Iceland remained nominally Christian um, for many centuries until um, the 20th century. And, and there were a number of, of events and writings, works that were done in the 19th century until a man called Svenborn Bainteinsen um, founded uh, an Asatru organization there. And um, actually uh, based on the laws existing in Iceland, applied to the government and, and had it formally recognized as one of the uh, official religions of Iceland. And so the folks there um, gained some government funding and so on, and they're in the process of building a temple, what we call Hof. Excuse, did you so say, I, did you say Hof? Uh, H-O-F. Oh, Hof. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you said, I'm picturing Iceland, you said Hof, wouldn't mean to lead to Star Wars. My mistake. Oh, yeah, you <laughs> got, <laughs> that's a good one. So anyway, with, with the founding of, of the Austria organization in Iceland, um, you know, obviously a, 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 this was a great thing, a great boom and very encouraging to a lot of Austria around the world. Um, but again, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as being a result of Christianization. I think it was more people wanting to get back in touch with their ancestral roots, um, connecting with um, the inherent holiness of, of nature, the sacred, the sacredness of nature and particularly in, in Iceland is a, is a place of very dramatic natural wonders and features. Um, you know, we've got the volcano is erupting there now. And so I, I think that this, uh, you know, Svenborn certainly wasn't the first person to have, have done this. You know, other people did it in other places around the world. And so I think that it, it was more a, a, a movement toward than a, than a movement away from um, Christianity or, or whatever. I'd like to thank my guest, Otar, again for doing this. Thank you, Otar. My pleasure. Thank you, Franklin. Here's the thing. If I were to refer to the acronym RPG, what would you think of? For some of you, you would think role-playing game, like these. And that would be accurate. But what if you thought of this? A rocket-propelled grenade? Well, that is not an acronym. It's a backronym. A backronym is when you have the individual letters and come up with the words afterward. RPG is a Russian acronym for this. Roughly translated as handheld anti-tank grenade launcher. Thomas Moore Jr. was a member of the Texas House of Representatives and wanted to prove a point. He knew his fellow elected officials often did not understand or even read the legislation on which they were voting. Representative Moore introduced a bill commending the life and work of Albert DeSalvo. It read, This compassionate gentleman's dedication and devotion to his work has enabled the weak and lonely throughout the nation to achieve and maintain a new degree of concern for their future. He has been officially recognized by the state of Massachusetts for his noted activities and unconventional techniques involving population control and applied psychology. It was passed by the House unanimously, but was then withdrawn by Mr. Moore since he had proven his point. Albert DeSalvo, the man recognized by the Texas legislature, had a more colorful nickname, the Boston Strangler. Well, thanks for watching and may the road rise with you. Well, that's a great question. That's a great question. That, that's a great question. That's a good question.